Welcome, everyone. I'm Felix Levine. To my right, John Ale, and our guest today, Larry Mazza. Thank you for, for joining us. Well, thanks for having me, for sure. So before we get into everything, we just want to make sure that uh, you subscribe to our YouTube channel right now, if you haven't done so, and also our Patreon. The link to the Patreon is in the description of this video. There, you'll be able to ask John anything you want. Uh, bonus content, early content, all of that is on the Patreon, so go check that out today. Larry, thank you uh, again for joining us. Real quick, hopping right into it. Um, for the people out there that aren't familiar with you, you know, obviously a lot of people are, but if they haven't, you know, watched you on, on different interviews and stuff, will you uh, give just a, a brief background on yourself? I feel like uh, you would do the, the best job of doing yeah, it. Yeah, well, I can do that. Uh, well, I started out, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a Brooklyn family growing up, a very normal life. Uh, nobody would have expected for me to turn in the direction I did. Uh, I, I did have an uncle who was around the Colombo family, but he kept all the kids away from it. Uh, as I got a little older, I met uh, a woman on a job that I had. And, you know, to cut to the chase, we wound up having an affair. And ultimately, I found out that her husband was uh, Greg Scarpa, uh, nicknamed the Grim Reaper. And he was a heavyweight uh, capo in the Colombo family. And ultimately, I wound up getting close with him and, and learning the life and uh, moving up in it, much like Johnny, and uh, being groomed, learning how to hit, learning how to hurt, learning how to kill, uh, you name it. And uh, ultimately, I came 360, got out of the life, uh, you know, on the crazy circumstances uh, after a war. And uh, now I'm pretty much, uh, you know, I'm working with the book. I, I, I got a TV series in the works with uh, Nick Pelleggi. He's writing it. Uh, so that's the Reader's Digest version of where I started and how I'm sitting here with you guys. Well, speaking of just, uh, you know, right off the bat with the Greg Scarpa and the wife and all that, as you just mentioned, I mean, the big question that, that we both, John and I, have gotten um, because people know, have known that, that you're coming on the show is, you know, how do you trust a guy who was, you know, such a notorious, prolific killer? Well, at the very young age, you're very uh, easily convinced or swayed or whatever the word is. So you got to realize I wasn't even 18. I'm with her for about a year. I don't know who he is at this point. She's going to introduce me to him. She convinces me that he's a he's a influential guy, has a lot of businesses. He can help me out in life. So when I first met him, even though, even though my first sight of him, I mean, it just said gangster all over him in hindsight. He the way he dressed, uh, you know, he was dressing like John Gotti way before John. I mean, he had the, the sharp uh, uh, suit on. He had, uh, you know, the sunglasses at night and uh, all the jewelry and the big black Fleetwood Rome. I mean, it just paint the picture, although they didn't tell me yet. But to answer your question, Greg is very charming. He's intelligent. Uh, as a matter of fact, an attorney once described him as uh, what I just said, charming, intelligent, good-looking, he could take you to dinner, and for dessert, he'd kill you. So he could adapt. I mean, he sat with judges, lawyers, uh, and obviously he was a bit of a chameleon because he was playing both sides of the fence for 30 years, which we'll talk about, I'm sure. Uh, but so it, it, it was my age. Later on, my questions were, you know, what was my role for real? I was wondering if I was making his life easier because he had two other wives, you know, the one I was with was his third wife. So, uh, and then other people say maybe he just enjoyed the thought of it. Who knows? Hey, Who knows? Hey, lad. But yeah, I don't yeah, mean John. to cut you off. So for the people that don't know, we never formally met each other. We have a lot of mutual friends. Uh, we both started off obviously young in this, in this life, uh, learned right. how to get involved in killing, setting them up with murder. Mm -hmm. But, as a young guy, I want to go back to what you said, because, you know, you're a young kid, you're 17, 18. Obviously, you, you got to be mm -hmm. impressed with the life, impressed with, with, with Greg at the time. Of course. And I don't think at your age, to answer the question Felix gave you, you really understood how treacherous this life could be at that point. So no. it was easy for him if he wanted to rock you to sleep, obviously bring you in and 
you know, you're in his house every day, could have tore you up. But at that yeah, at that age, we're not even thinking that. You're just thinking probably, hey, this guy really likes me. He's treating me like his his nephew yeah. or his son. Is that really how you're right. looking at it at that time? Absolutely. He introduced me as his nephew. But you just touched on something that I said somewhere not too long ago. We're very recruitable at that age. They also right. see traits in us. If you were your age now, or the way I am now, the guy came to me and tried to bring me into something, I'm going to be very skeptical. I'm going to be, my antennas are going to go up. I'm a lot more uh, educated in life. Okay, I'm not going to jump at the easy money and that easy way out. Right. You know, so who gets recruited? Right. Young kids that are impressionable. You just hit the word on the head. And I was impressed. I saw the respect he got. Uh, and as time went on, I learned to act the way he wanted me to. And then I got the respect and then well, I earned it. Well, one of the things going back, I just want to twist something is because I watch some of your other interviews and I talk to some of our mutual friends. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I do on the show, and I think you know that is we give the other side of this of the kids we're trying to reach out and tell them don't buy into yeah. what we bought into right. because you're going to ruin mm -hmm. your life. And we want to, mm -hmm. and, and part of this is not to, you know, is for them to understand our stories and understand how close you came to death yourself on many right. occasions, which you know, not just from possibly could have been from him, but his enemies became your enemies. And this is mm -hmm. the part that I want these kids to understand because you had mm -hmm. to start to deal with every time you took a ride with him, uh, you're, you're right. possibly losing your life. Every second you got, you stood next to him. And, yeah. and then you had to start to deal with that and really understand the treachery mm -hmm. yourself. Absolutely. You know, there's a, there's a perfect example of that. Before our Colombo War started, a few years earlier, when Greg Jr. got into the big drug business really, really big, uh, there was a group of Irish guys, three brothers mainly, or two brothers and a father. Uh, I think they're all dead now. I'll mention their names were Brennan. And they were tough guys. And they were in the business, and they wouldn't come in for anything. They were not going to negotiate. Uh, so they went as far as threatening, you come after us, we'll come after you. So we had to travel in a brigade every day. And I was in the car with him, like you just said. I said, someday they could pull up and, and start firing away. Ultimately, we got two of them first, and the other brother took off. It's hard to go against the whole family. Yeah. Well, you know, let me that, fast no forward for a second. So yeah. you were around when, uh, you know, obviously the, the war started. You, mm -hmm. I, I listened to one of the other things. It was a little bit of a people that don't understand this. There was a little bit of a cold war that was going on in the late 80s prior to the shooting really starting. Yes. There were drips yes. and drabs and killings. Our friends were all involved in these murders. You were involved in them. But eventually, Wild Bill tries to hit Greg, or he's behind right. that. Were you involved? Did you know anything about that that hit itself? Oh, uh, absolutely. Can you tell the yeah. people a little bit about that? Because yeah, Bill was well, a dangerous well, guy too before he gets killed. Yeah, no, but Billy and Billy had a dangerous crew. Billy yeah. had a good a good crew, capable guys. Uh, well, you know, like you said, there was a cold war. There was a stretch where things were happening, bodies were turning up. They were blaming it for other stuff. But Greg knew whether it was from his friend telling him through wiretaps over here and different things, or just his his. Uh, uh, experience in life and going back wars, he knew we were headed for trouble. He said, eventually we're going to be in a shooting war. We Nobody else knew anything, but he was telling us that. So long story short, there was a few meetings we went to where he was trying to be coaxed in to back Vicarina. Right. And ultimately there was a big standoff and it was at Wild Bill's Club where we pulled up with seven guys. They had literally... Yeah, dozens, a couple of dozens, dozens guys, yeah, I know. Yeah, man, probably, you know, I, I say a hundred, and I'm afraid to say that because people must say this guy's nuts, but there was, I mean, the whole street was laying That was guys. a different time at, at those days when yeah. we used to go to the matches, but people don't understand yeah. that it, yeah. that wasn't uh, something that was, uh, where you're embellishing, right. because that was right. part of life back then. They can't yeah. imagine how it was back then. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, even though maybe only uh, 30 of them were main guys, this is Drop by tonight. Bring your friends and buddies. Make show the numbers. So anyway, we pull up, and after that night, it was now known that Greg did not wasn't going against Junior Persico. So they had to make a move. They take him out. He was the number one shooter on our side, and uh, 
what, what happened was they they probably were watching the house. They knew the time we left every day. He was too regimented to change his times. He was a little crazy like that. So about 1230, maybe one, one o'clock, he comes walking out and he's got his grandson in his arms and little Linda's in the car too. Oh, he's coming out to, to go in her car. So as they get in the cars, Greg pulls out. Linda is right behind the Lincoln. Right. And they see a van pull up. As they get to the corner, a panel truck comes and, and blocks them in. Danny, who was driving, was watching his rear, rear view mirror and he said, it's going down. Because we were waiting. We knew something right. was going to happen. So they come out of the car and they start firing shotguns and stuff. But everybody jumps out and points back, shooting back now. Linda's in the middle of this crossfire. And she dives on her baby. And she don't, you know, all she knows is there's a lot of shooting. So now they stop approaching because they're getting shot at also. I mean, that little bullet, I don't care if you had a shotgun or what. You know, bullets were flying both ways. Yeah. So everybody held up. They were able to get back in the car. And I'll tell you why I said they. Get back in the car and take off. And there was just enough room for the Lincoln to get through that they were driving, that Danny and, and Joey and, and whoever else was in the car. They make a left. The van couldn't fit through because the driver to, of the truck already left. He was in right. the credit car, get, you know, get away, whatever. So they had to jump out and run to the cars that were waiting. Now, Larry, so I have a question for around. you. I mean, yeah. you know, both John has talked about it a, a bunch and, and yourself as well. I mean, the, the life is obviously s stressful in a lot of ways. Were there ever, uh, <laughs> to say the least, were there ever uh, any times um, that you, you know, were looking either for an out or you just said this is too much or any doubts? You know, it's funny you said that. Uh, and it's strange to say it. the things that scare me more or, or bother me more is that I was adaptable and that quickly adaptable. I, you know, I, it was, as I was moving up with him, I never thought about getting out during the war. I didn't, as a matter of fact, there's one thing that happened during the war. Now the war was very stressful. I mean, we had bulletproof vests. We couldn't go anywhere without, you know, looking over our shoulder. Uh, and there were a few instances that had to be stressful, you know, but, there was a, a, a night we'd come out of a diner and Greg had told us recently, me and Jimmy, that we were the only three to ever be together. Even guys in our crew, he said, somebody's going to give us up to get this over with. So the three of us always got to stay together, which we did. So we go to a diner in Staten Island and we meet some of our own guys. Okay. So on the way out, we go to the parking lot. We each get in our door, four-door car, and we get in. As we get in, there's two rows of guys walking on each side of the car, okay? I didn't reach for my gun. Jimmy didn't try to get the car started, and Greg didn't move. We were resigned to get shot to death right there. That's what bothers me more than anything, that I got so into this thing that I said, all right, like, it's almost like I, I threw the wrong card. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I lost the hand, you know. But you know what it was? John, it's hysterical. They were walking with bowling bags. It was a bowling <laughs> team. So it was like six guys. And when we and we just, we, they, you just laughed. That's what we did, a, a nervous laugh. And, but after that minute, we never, ever forgot to leave space in front of a car. Yeah. Jimmy had the left mirror. Greg had the right mirror. I was always looking around at cars. Well, I think, you know, just what you said, I don't think anybody just as rushes into anything. It's like right. jumping in a pool. I say it all the time. You put your foot in a little bit. You get adapted mm -hmm. to it as a kid. You're not afraid of it. You go a little further. You go to the ocean. Right. Same thing. It's some of the things you're saying about, you know, you. these are things that, that the average public doesn't understand. Right. When you're driving a car and you get up to a red light and it's traffic, you, you never pull up to his bumper for the reasons you just said. And you learn, you right. know, these are the things that we take and we don't even talk about it usually on these shows, but it's a good point right. you brought up because the public don't understand it. And it's good to talk about it. So when you're pulling up to a car, you're usually looking, don't pull right alongside another car so they can't bang you next to you. Don't pull right behind another car's bumper. 
Because if he doesn't move, you can't move. If they get behind you and yeah. squeeze you in and shoot you up. Yeah. So these are things that we learn and get educated right. like somebody does in school. Yeah. And these you right. know, the regular people really don't know. So it's good that you're bringing yeah. it up so it's, these it's, young kids yeah. understand what we're talking about, right. the treachery. And why it, it I talk sounds, against it, Larry? You talk yeah, against yeah. it. No, I mean, you got to be nuts it's, not to talk against this right, life. Right, right. It sounds stressful, but it becomes second nature. And, and that is just the facts. It becomes second nature. I think that's the best way to describe it. You, 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 you start looking at things that no normal person would look at. Well, resigned, like you said, you are resigned to get shot. Yeah, we are resigned. Right. Every time you leave the house, yeah. honestly, whether you talk yeah. about it or not, it's just part of our routine. You know that possibly you can't, you might not come home tonight, mm -hmm. whether it's getting killed or getting locked up. That's just part right. of it. And we, and we yeah. just deal with it naturally. Like it's, you know, yeah. it's just our routine. Yeah. And you're right. It's good to let younger kids hear that, right. that it's not normal. And, you know, there was a, uh, I did a podcast not long ago. Uh, and the guy asked pretty much, what is, would you tell a younger kid? I'd say, take the advice that your mother and father gave you that none of us listen to. Most of us don't listen to the young, you know, we just go about our, our, our business, you know, but listen, listen to those people that care about you. Like my